We acknowledge the Yuggera and Ghana nations as traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and learn, and their continuing connection with the land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their elders past and present. All content related to this program is for general informational purposes only and contains stories and discussion around mental health that may be disturbing to some listeners. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional and individual advice and support. More details are contained in our show notes. Every time you do a study that you think you've kind of isolated a little piece of the puzzle, inevitably it raises more questions. And so you think, oh, now I need to... We didn't think about that. That's neuroscientist and neuropsychologist Miran Irish. And this is Reframe of Mind. We're your hosts, Louise Poole and Andy Leroy, and we'll hear from Mirren Irish later in this episode, along with some of the other wonderful women of science that we're speaking to, including Professor Leanne Carey from the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health, Dr. Lisa Salzman from the School of Psychological Science at the University of Western Australia, and Associate Professor Kimberly Norris at the University of Tasmania. Last time on Reframe of Mind, we spoke about risk-taking mm. and realised while we want to make changes, we tend to make similar types of choices that emerge as patterns in our life. So yeah, we started wondering if it's actually possible to change our brains. Yeah, we were talking about the philosophical and feeling subjects in this podcast, Andy, mm, but it is yeah. important to bring it back to the science because while we've been talking about changing the way that we think, sometimes those theories can quickly start to come across as platitudes and run the risk of being turned into toxic positivity. Yeah, and we've been big on wanting to cut through those platitudes mm. in this series, but I guess in some way we kind of felt that even saying that statement at the front of the program is starting to sound a bit like a platitude, isn't it? <laughs> it's a cycle <laughs> of a platitude. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, uh, so we, we wanted to um, phrase it differently. Actually, here's what we wanted to do. Reframe our statement. Go. Okay. So Reframe of Mind is a podcast about mental health, but mm-hmm. we find that when people want to talk about mental health, what they actually mean is mental illness. One of our favourite phrases in the series is that we don't exist in a vacuum. So mental health and the way that we talk about it shouldn't either. Yeah, so it's kind of understanding that we are profoundly influenced Mm. by the world around us, you know, and also the biology that we take through life that we've been handed to us, you know, through our parents and our genes and that sort of thing. So looking after our mental health over our lifetimes, it is more than grabbing a quick fix and a platitude. You know, we have to gain an understanding of what makes us tick. So it's important to understand why we do the things we do and how the things we do are influenced by the world around us as well. It might sometimes sound a bit like woo-woo, this concept of neuroplasticity, but that's because the science is so new and constantly expanding. Uh, The scientific research, though, it backs up the theories that prove that we can change our brains. In fact, we do it every day. Yeah, so in this episode, we're going to talk to some of Australia's leading female voices in STEM about the science of changing our thinking, because there's nothing like solid evidence to support new ideas about our capabilities. Professor Leanne Carey is a world-leading Australian neuroscientist in occupational therapy and stroke rehabilitation and recovery research, working at the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. We decided to start with a lesson in Neuroplasticity 101, and Leanne was happy to oblige. Neuroplasticity, it's about that ability of the nervous system to respond to stimuli by reorganising its structure, function and connection. So it's essentially that underlying phenomenon that allows us to change, adapt and learn. One thing too that's important to remember in this is that it's the changes are experience and learning dependent. They occur during development, throughout the normal lifespan, and actually in response to injury. And actually, there's probably already a number of your listeners that might have heard about the concept of neuroplasticity. And it's in things like the book, um, The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doidge. Yeah, that was the first place I heard it. yeah, Yeah. And on the television series, for example, Redesign My Brain by Todd Sampson. So I think um, the knowledge that the brain can change, this concept of neuroplasticity is now becoming mainstream. It's important for us all to know that the brain's changing its function and networks constantly. Whatever we do, 
even now. This is encouraging news. Yeah. And something that we're going to continue the conversation with throughout this episode, especially with Leanne in relation to stroke recovery. But for now, let's take a deeper look into the structure of our brains and what different areas are responsible for. We kind of thought this might be important to understand if we're going to try and change the way we think and respond to things. Miran Irish is an Australian Research Council Future Fellow and Associate Professor of Psychology at the Brain and Mind Centre at the University of Sydney. Her research is focused on the cognitive neuroscience of memory, with a specialisation in exploring memory changes caused by dementia. For anyone whose eyes normally glaze over at scientific theory, um, (laughs) be prepared to be wowed by how relatable Miran actually makes it all sound. The structures that are deeper inside the brain are more likely to be the older ones. And these are the ones that we kind of see are conserved across different species. And so the ones that are more near the front of the brain, so the fact that humans have a prefrontal cortex, these are the regions that are more recent in terms of our evolutionary history. And these are the ones that give us all of the extra sort of human um, cognitive or thinking capacities that we've evolved to have. And so the prefrontal cortex is more attuned to flexible forms of thinking, having control over our thoughts, being able to have a sort of sense of self-awareness, being able to introspect and to sort of reflect on your behavior and then calibrate or titrate or respond and change your behavior in response to different sort of contingencies or changes in the environment. So it's kind of a combination of older structures that are more attuned to, you know, those very um, basic feelings of pleasure and those sort of primary evolutionary driven, you know, searching for a mate or searching for food, as well as the prefrontal structures, which are more sophisticated forms of monitoring and being strategic and being flexible in the same process. I have this image in my head now of us being like a tree. We cut ourselves open and we've got all those different rings on the inside of the brain. It's not quite like that, but (laughs) yeah, it's, it's very complex. And, you know, when we're talking about these different functions, it's important to know that like there aren't there isn't really just one region that just does one function. It's very, very complicated. And now we're starting to move away from this kind of one structure function mapping towards a much more network based approach where different regions might actually work together sort of in concert to do different things, but they may reorganize and then pair up with a different set of regions, you know, in the service of a different function. So it's very, very complicated. And the whole field has kind of shifted towards a more network-based approach. So we've started to understand the structure of the brain and how the brain functions and is changeable throughout our lives. Let's bring it into the context of our conversation in this series about mental health and how the brain's evolution is set up for what has become negative thinking in modern times. Someone who was able to describe this perfectly for us was Dr. Lisa Salzman. You might remember her from episode three of this series when we were just starting to understand depression and anxiety. Lisa is a senior lecturer and deputy clinical director with the School of Psychological Science at the University of Western Australia. Do you think we inherently are negative thinkers as a species? I, I do. I do think from an evolutionary perspective, our mind was built to find the bad stuff. You know, actually, that's our mind's design is to look for threat, to look for the negative, to look at what might go wrong to protect ourselves. And, you know, um, in, in caveman or cave person time, should I say, you know, that was a protective way to be because everyday life was a very threatening, dangerous place. You know, you fast forward to now and everyday life isn't quite the same as that. Yeah, our mind was always built to do that. So even when there aren't those legitimate real kind of threats facing us, our mind will try to find them. I think our mind will try to sort of seek them out and seek them out everywhere. And and that can be, you know, really turning inward and looking for our own, you know, perceived personal faults and failings and sort of bringing those to the forefront, you know, to warn us that, you know, others might see it too. So, yeah, I do think that really generally the norm is to hone in on the negative uh, as a protective sort of a function, but unfortunately it gets overdone now and um, and starts to backfire on us in, in uh, you know, depleting our, our mental health, Not you know, instead of what was first designed to protect us is now working against us. How do we notice that to begin with? Like how much uh, negative thought is good for us? 
Um, how much neg- I, I think, you know, it, it's absolutely normal to have negative thoughts. So, you know, having negative thoughts pop into our mind um, is, is really, as I said, it's our mind's design. So it's very normal that will happen and we'll worry about certain things, whether they're realistic things or not realistic things. I think for me, it's about how much thinking we do how long you spend caught in those thoughts. So for me, it's not that people have negative thoughts. I don't think that's a problem or an issue. I think it's um, how how much time we spend listening to those thoughts, how much we get caught in them. Mm. So it's really excessive negative thinking that becomes the problem, like excessive overthinking and overanalyzing, I think um, really is, is something that is a bit of a, a plague of you know human beings I think at the moment yeah. and that you know terms we might use for that are thought process like worrying you're mm-hmm. worrying about the future or ruminating on the past but just generally that idea of excessive overthinking I, I think is problematic so for me it's not negative thoughts that are a problem it's the amount or excessiveness that you know excessive nature of that thinking that's the issue. Associate Professor Kimberly Norris has given us some great insights from a psychology perspective throughout the series. Mm. She's a researcher, head of discipline and director of the postgraduate program School of Psychological Sciences at the University of Tasmania and has helped us to learn how the brain forms new ways of understanding and responding. Does the body respond better to messages of you know dr- trying to retrain with that internal voice, or does it respond better to things like muscle stretching, the aromatherapy, the other senses when we're trying to retrain ourselves? Ideally, it's actually a combination of both that internal voice as well as those physical approaches because the brain has a really strong connection with the body and they speak to each other all the time. So if you actually act on both, at the same time, you're literally those new neural pathways you're building in your brain, which actually underpin patterns of behavior. They underpin routines and rhythms. They actually build much more quickly and are reinforced more strongly when they're getting multiple sensory input. So when it's your internal voice, as well as your actions, they build together. And over time, this neural pathway builds And the more we use it, the stronger it becomes. And that's actually why you never break a habit as an adult, because you literally have a neural pathway in your brain for that habit. And we instead replace them, which literally means building a new, more preferable neural pathway in your brain that becomes the dominant pattern. How long does it take to build a new pathway? Depends on how complex the behavior is. More simple behaviours can be achieved, you know, quite quickly. More complex behaviours can take weeks. But the idea is the more often you activate this neural structure, the more often you activate this pathway, the more energy, literally, the more energy you're sending to it to grow. Leanne Carey, in the course of her research in stroke rehabilitation, has observed how our brains change at different points of our lives. There's really compelling evidence now that the brain can change that has this neuroplastic capacity throughout the lifespan. So whilst a person is younger, there might be more rapid changes, we can still change throughout the lifespan. And I think this is really so crucial when we're working with different people at different life stages to to know that there's this possibility. And the people, for example, that I work with who have a stroke, that it really provides a hope for change. When it comes to um, people affected by stroke, I'm I'm wondering, is it easier to retrain a brain that has had a a trauma like that? Actually, the plasticity is enhanced by an injury like that. Mm. So it does have a special significance for a person who's had had a stroke. They're sort of challenged to move and think and feel with an altered brain and body. And this phenomenon really opens a window to change and adaptation really in the days, weeks, months and even years after stroke. I often say to the people with stroke that I work with, they actually have an even greater capacity for change and adaption because of that injury. And they can learn new skills on a day-to-day basis like we can But we have to also be aware that they could learn habits and movements that are not so helpful, such as they might learn not to use that limb. 
So whilst there's a greater capacity, it's also important that we really work to harness that capacity for a positive change. Is there a theory why the brain becomes more moldable at this point? Well, I, I think it's really that because there's a force, it's a challenge for it so that the person, you know, there's part of the network that's not working properly. Um, so there has to be some way of trying to reconnect between those parts that are working and or to help support some of that um, breakdown in a particular region that might have uh, occurred. So I suppose when you use the word more moldable, it, it, it's almost a need base because of the challenge and whether or not it's more moldable but it, or whether it's that it has to be moulded yeah. <laughs> because th there's these gaps going on. And, you know, we often think about, you know, how we change the brain to change the behaviour, but really it's also both ways how we change the behaviour to change the brain. So there's a, a two-way process going on. Mirren, in her research, observes how behaviour is influenced by our drive for pleasure. Essentially, it all boils down to the fact that we have to think back to evolution and what is going to give us the biggest sort of survival advantage. And anything that confers an, a sort of adaptive um, advantage then needs to be assigned something that's positive. So if we think about like the main rewards that, a, you know, a Neanderthal or an animal actually would need their food, their mateship and sex and that's basically and then avoiding predators and so them being bestowed with like a pleasurable experience means it's more likely that the animal or the human is going to try and seek these things out work or allocate effort to get these things and also hopefully avoid predators and negative outcomes in the in the process so essentially i think much of our behavior is actually driven by this sort of underlying sort of drive to receive pleasure or to experience pleasure. And it just so happens that that actually confers a very important survival advantage. What's happening in the brain from that perspective that's going on that's causing us that pleasure? Yeah, so there's a very um, sophisticated network in the brain um, and it's part of this dopaminergic system. So this is a system that's heavily sort of oriented or geared to dopamine, which is one of the main neurotransmitters in the brain. And so the network that's implicated when we do experience those feelings of pleasure, like, you know, the tingles when you hear your favorite tune, um, there are regions in the front of the brain, in the frontal lobe, and then there are regions in an area deep inside the brain called the striatum. And collectively, they are sort of like these hedonic hotspots is the term that's used in the literature. So they fire or activate when we respond in that pleasurable way to a stimulus. So if you're you know, biting into, you know, a lovely warm slice of pizza or something. These are the regions that will get activated in the brain. And so they, they um, largely are driven by this dopaminergic neurotransmitter. And it's what gives us these feelings of pleasure. And it's very reinforcing. So it actually, we will remember those feelings in response to a stimulus. And also we can anticipate and look ahead to sort of think ahead and sort of plan out how we might actually work towards and achieve other similar rewards. Lisa Salzman agrees, telling us we're basically built to run away from uncomfortable experiences. And I know, Louise, you can definitely relate to this. <laughs> One of the things that when I was reading about your the Manage My Emotions program, uh, you know, one of those pillars being intolerating uncomfortable feelings, uh, yeah. th that strikes a chord in me because if there's something that I'm working on, it's not that I feel bad, it's actually that I'm feeling bad about feeling bad. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think it's very much a part of, you know, human nature for us to, um, I guess, really not want... Uh, you know, yeah, we are, as I said, built to not sort of um, to run away from or try to avoid uncomfortable experiences. That's very natural for us to do. Um, we're really, you know, similarly as I've just been talking about, we're kind of hardwired to do that as a yeah. protective thing. But 
Um, unfortunately, doing that with our feelings, you know, it's very hard to run away from your own feelings and it also just backfires. Like the more that you don't want that feeling, kind of like the more you have it kind of thing. So the more we fight and struggle and try to get rid of our feelings, the more they're just going to fight back and sort of try to hang around even longer or even more intensely. And I also think for some people, some of the methods that they might use to try and get rid of their feelings can can also be damaging in and of themselves. You know, things like you know, might be using drugs or alcohol or mm. self-harm or, you know, maybe it's just avoiding things or procrastinating other sorts of behaviours that, you know, just end up hurting ourselves kind of thing. But these might be things we use to try and get away from our feelings. If you've ever wondered how important our emotions are to our cognitive flexibility, Kimberly Norris explains. When we get some um, momentum going around adapting to change, like, so we, we, we start positively adapting to change, and then does that make it easier to kind of keep adapting to change? Like once we, we stop treating change as either good or bad? Most definitely. And it's quite fundamental to um, an aspect of experience called cognitive flexibility. So cognitive flexibility is essentially when you are able to see that there are always multiple options of experiencing, interpreting and responding to any given situation. And Cognitive flexibility is absolutely that idea of rather than good or bad, so take away what we call the valence, so take away the emotional component and recognise objectively it's different. And different means we can shape whether it can be positive or negative, at least to some degree. The other really exciting thing is not only does this help you adapt positively to change going forward and across a whole range of contexts, there's some really exciting research that shows that cognitive flexibility can also help to protect from cognitive decline that you might see in dementias. That's really fascinating. So yeah. getting better at change is, is better for our brain. It is. It really is. And of course, the fact that we're living longer, it means we do need to start thinking about our brain health, perhaps a little bit more than we have in the past. I wanted to, to clarify, does this indicate that there's a level of dissociation that needs to happen along this process? Not necessarily dissociation but an ability to regulate emotions. And I think that's mm. actually another really interesting thing that I think there's just an assumption made that we all learn how to manage emotions, but it's actually mm. a really, really hard thing to do. And I'm sure many of us have had those moments of mm. saying, oh my goodness, I reacted in a way that I probably didn't feel fully in control of just then. So I think emotion regulation, which is a fancy way of saying learning how to manage our emotions, is also something that all people would benefit from. Now, I really need to make sure that people understand that doesn't mean you don't experience emotion. That's not it at all. Emotions mm. are normal. They're healthy. They're necessary. But it's understanding that we emotions serve a purpose. And when you manage your emotions, they serve that po purpose effectively rather than making our lives more difficult. Not surprisingly, Mirren has discovered that memory is linked to emotion. If you think about the types of memories that you can actually remember and the ones that are important to you or have left a sort of a salient mark in terms of your own sense of self, inevitably they will have an emotional component. And again, this is really crucial if you think back I mean I keep saying about this evolutionary sort of mm. point of view but if you think about why we would have memory in the first place again it has to serve some sort of adaptive survival function so you need to remember the things that had a good outcome and you also need to remember the things that didn't actually pan out so well so you will avoid those types of negative scenarios in the future and so if you take that into sort of current neuroscience, we know that when you experience a particularly emotional or arousing event, there is a coupling between a structure called the amygdala, which is very sensitive to emotion or, you know, valence and arousal of situations. And that couples with the hippocampus, which is one of the key memory structures and actually provides a much more indelible and much more enduring memory trace. And so that's when we see things like when, you know, people have very traumatic um, experiences, then it can leave, you know, enduring memories that are very difficult to shift and can lead to sort of post-traumatic stress disorder where the memories are reactivated and re-experienced in. I feel like my brain kind of redacts information if a memory associated around it has been really painful or traumatic. Like, mm. I mean, grief in particular is a great 
great one. And my example is always things like, you know, dead cats or broken relationships. It's, uh, it's, it's like sometimes I forget that those experiences existed because everything connected with that grief kind of goes back in to activate it. So is that, I mean, I, I don't think I have dementia, um, but that sounds similar to what people experience going through that. So what what's kind of going on with us there? I assume other people have this experience and it's not, <laughs> I'm not the anomaly. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think the scenario of grief and its relationship to memory is very complex. And I think we don't have enough, you know, there's not enough um, study actually being directed towards that. What we do know is that obviously negative events are very much retrieved in more detail. But I think the caveat is that there can come a point where you've retrieved something so many times that you actually start to lose the the detail and the specificity of the memory. And it becomes much more abstracted, almost like a fact or a very over general sort of a schematic of the event. And also when you factor in then that very heavy burden of emotion that comes with, you know, a bereavement and grief, there is almost a protective sort of function, I think, that comes into play that we don't fully understand yet, where it's almost as though you reach a certain tipping point of emotion and the brain will be able to recall the gist of the event, but will not be able to focus as squarely on the emotions. And it may just be a way of protecting against painful reliving of an mm. event over and over again. So it's it's very interesting. And I think there's probably a lot of differences in terms of, you know, individual differences in how we actually um, are attuned to these types of events and how we replay or deny or suppress or cope with these varying emotions. If you've ever returned to study in any capacity, you've probably found that you're better at retaining the information because your choice to study is more meaningful. And as it turns out, meaningful activities work best in stroke recovery as well, according to Leanne. If we think about our brain being a network to help us do things and to achieve a goal if that goal is meaningful it already the person is already working with you to achieve that Mm. um and it's focused so that there's the opportunity to then call on the parts of the network that are important to that particular task and if I give one example so we work on actually helping people regain a sense of touch and use it in everyday activities and there's different layers to the goals that are meaningful for them it might be first the goal of the sensation just to feel if there's a difference between two surfaces through to the goal of being able to hold a fork without dropping it, for example. So uh, the meaningfulness is really critical to get that buy-in and then the steps along the way to achieve that goal. For people living with dementia, Mirren has discovered that music is a very powerful force. It reminds me of um, a time when I was working with people who were living with dementia in the aged care sector. And the activities that always went better were the ones where we didn't rely on them to have any great input into an outcome. So other than enjoying it. So for example, I would run a session of art with one of the um, one of the groups. There was quite a range of outcome with with the individuals there. Some of them painted abstract, really colourful pieces on the paper. Some of them found the brushes a little bit too much to use, so they'd use their fingers and still make some quite quite nice works. And then there was one lady I remember who picked up the brush, poked it into the paint, and then put it straight into her mouth. And when I asked why she did it, she said that it looked delicious, like mm. something she wanted to eat. So. For people living with dementia, is it more about the senses and trying to actually help them to just be in the moment? Yeah, I think there's a huge aspect of it um, in just constraining the experience to the present moment and taking the pressure off as well, as you said, to not have it as working towards an outcome, but actually the process in itself is just one of enjoyment and experience. And if we circle back to our opening kind of topic about pleasure, Mm. it's interesting because the studies that have been done on music in particular in dementia, in Alzheimer's disease, 
show that, um, you know, when we image the brain of people who have got Alzheimer's disease, that um, set of structures, that frontostriatal brain circuit that I was mentioning, doesn't appear to be as damaged as many of the memory structures or the spatial memory or the navigation structures are. And they remain preserved for a remarkably long time into the disease course. So it seems that if you can tailor the activity to the individuals with Alzheimer's disease, they can derive pleasure from those experiences through this circuit. And so that's been suggested to be one of the reasons maybe why music therapy and art therapy are so effective because that capacity to experience pleasure is still there. It's just finding the right key to unlock it, you know, using maybe personally relevant stimuli or personally relevant music. Um, So it's really interesting. And I think one of the things that I particularly like about music is that you can use these types of approaches in even the very severely impaired um, individuals living in, you know, assisted or residential aged care. They don't need to be able to, you know, communicate verbally, but more often than not, this approach will reach everyone. It's like the great sort of universal communicating tool. You'll find people who haven't spoken, being able to sway or tap or move along to the beat. And it just seems to be a very potent way of engaging again, even if it's non-verbally, but communicating back to people who have been, you know, unreachable for a time. So let's bring this into the context of cognitive therapy, where someone isn't impaired by the impact of stroke or dementia. Working with imagery is something that Lisa identifies is particularly successful. When we think, we can think in lots of different ways and we can think in more what we might call verbal linguistic ways. So I mean, what I mean by that is like in words and sentences and we think of that that voice in our head and that self-talk kind of thing. Um, But we can also think more in imaginal ways, like in mental images and other kind of sensory forms. Um, And there's actually lots of research to show that um, imagery sort of sort of based thinking connects more powerfully to our emotions than more verbal wordy kind of based thinking so and just as an example you know if you were to say the word chocolate cake to yourself you know a few times just to yourself you probably wouldn't have much of a reaction but if I asked you to close your eyes and imagine in great vivid detail a chocolate cake (laughs) then I do this exercise with a lot of people like a lot of people will find themselves sort of salivating and having sort of hunger kind of urges that that's if you like chocolate cake of course I love chocolate Um, cake I I do too I do too Um, so you know that's just like a a way of illustrating that your imagery connects really powerfully to our emotional and physiological experiences so and and the reason for that is that our brain actually isn't very good at distinguishing an image from reality so our brain is sort of processing what we're imagining in quite a similar way to if that were actually happening for real. So therefore we're responding emotionally, physiologically, as if what we're imagining were somewhat real. So I think because of that, you know, people might, you know, anyone that's familiar with CBT might be used to kind of tuning into more the verbal thoughts and the sentences of, you know, meaning that they're bringing to situation. But it's quite interesting to sort of try and tune into the snapshots of mental images that might also be popping up you know like so again an example would be I might have the thought you know I'm going to make a fool of myself on this podcast so it's like a sentence in my head a bit of self-talk but I could have the image of someone listening to the podcast and sort of rolling their eyes at something that I've said and so that's you know kind of tuning into not just what we set kind of self-talk but are there little snapshots of images that are also representing how we're seeing situations. Now If you've ever heard someone say the brain can't tell the difference between fact and fiction and thought it was toxic positivity (laughs) claptrap, think again. Mirren explains. A few people say to us uh, from a psychologist's point of view that the brain can't tell the difference between uh, our imagined reality and uh, reality reality. What is your thoughts on that? Um, that's uh, It's an interesting debate. So I think there's a difference in terms of the imagination that I study in terms of the perception of the world around us and how we make sense of the world mm. by perceiving different sensory inputs. So one of the things that I'm, I'm particularly interested in is this relationship between memory and imagination and how similar are the two and how much do they differ? And so there's been a lot of interest. This is a huge topic in terms of, you know, cognitive neuroscience of memory is whether memory and imagination are actually the same thing, um, which on the surface seems to be a very 
strange question to pose because we all know what memory is and we all have memory and we all have a fundamental understanding of what memory means to us. But then if you say, well, is memory just imagination? People start to get very confused, but this is, seems to be where the literature is kind of going at the moment. And um, it's basically because there was a discovery just over 10 years ago now that when people are remembering events from their past and when they're envisaging events that might happen in the future, the same core brain regions and same core network activates. And so there's massive overlap in terms of the structures and the regions that fire up to enable us to remember and to imagine. And the overlap is so strong. If you were to look at the scans of people, you wouldn't be able to actually tell who's remembering, who's imagining. So it's led to this sort of rethinking of memory almost as a form of like mental construction. And that the some people have gone as far as to say that memory in itself doesn't really serve us all that well. It's more the imagination that we can construct from the elements of our memory. That's the important thing to ensure that we can survive, adapt and plan. Does that make people who daydream or whose mind wander probably a bit more happier than the rest? I would say so, yeah. And I mean, again, this is another area of explosion in cognitive neuroscience because that same core network that I mentioned is also highly activated when people mind wander and daydream. So when you're daydreaming or letting your mind go, your brain is actually highly active. So it's not idle in the slightest. Your brain is hard at work when you're daydreaming. And the majority of thoughts that we have when we're daydreaming are actually prospective. So they're future oriented. And again, this has led some of the big theorists in the field to suggest that when you're daydreaming, it's really, really important from an evolutionary perspective. It's allowing you to test hypotheses, to you know, enact out different scenarios, to do all of these things and to plan, test and predict without engaging in the behavior that would actually possibly come with a cost. So you can you know, test out whether you give a cheeky answer in a meeting without having to actually do it to see the reaction of what the person would be. And you can imagine why maybe a colleague is having a bad day and maybe made a snappy comment at you without having to go and ask them. So there's ways that we can actually test our hypotheses and act on the world, but it's through imagination without us having to go out and do every possible permutation and see just what happens. So it's a very sophisticated way of letting us operate on our environment without actually engaging in the physicality of it. And it's been shown to serve a number of different creative, social, memory and planning functions that, you know, really elevate it from just simply someone not paying attention or someone, you know, idly just engaging in sort of some whimsical fantasy. It actually, there's a growing consensus now that daydreaming is really highly important from an evolutionary and adaptive perspective. In a practical sense, Leanne has conducted research involving brain scans that identify the brain's use of anticipation in stroke recovery things we saw in uh, one of the videos that you were doing had to do it was a scan of the brain sensing and then the other side was a scan of the brain anticipating and yeah. what, what struck me as really interesting is there's not a lot of difference between the two no. in our yeah. ability to anticipate something yeah and I feel like that has um, more applications than just a, a stroke recovery in um, our imagination it seems like it's really important yeah it is quite a powerful well knowing that is quite powerful in how we can use it and it's quite interesting to know that that is the way that our brain works so particularly when a person's had a prior experience for example of feeling that if they then imagine it shortly afterwards basically the similar area of the brain is involved so we actually directly use that in the sequence in which we explore sensations and use it in the task and in that deliberate anticipation that I talked about before. And then we also get that person to imagine what the sensation is supposed to feel like after having just had that prior experience. And all of that is coming together to try and sort of prime that part of the brain that might have been challenged in the context of the network so that they have a greater ability to tune in to the stimulus that's coming 
in and to make sense of it. And that's the light bulb moment that we see so often. It, it, it's quite remarkable, actually. You know, we love a bit of woo-woo, Andy. Yeah. yeah. So this seemed like the perfect time to explore the brain's ability to time travel with Mirren. Now, we know that when we remember an event from the past, we're not actually remembering the original experience. So we are remembering the last time that we replayed, you know, reconstructed this event. So there are all these theories about how memories are just the last sort of iteration of a constructive process. And that's why memory is so fallible and so vulnerable to distortion and to errors. Because if you reconstruct a memory and then maybe some information is brought in that's counter to your original experience. So someone might say, no, I was wearing a red coat that day. You said I was wearing a blue coat and that's incorrect. You will probably retrieve that event with the incorrect information now incorporated into your new memory trace. So we're constantly updating and reconstructing our memory, but this can give rise to errors and distortions. And the same thing then, we reconstruct the past that also enables us to construct the future. And so we're able to you know, draw upon our stored memories that we've experienced and say, well, if I do travel to, you know, Antarctica, what do I know about it? What do I know about travel? What do I know about, you know, the people that might come with me? And you can actually construct a very realistic and, you know, highly salient event that you have no prior experience of because you have all of this knowledge that you can delve into and reconfigure and reconstruct. Can we use this to our advantage, the the fact that memory is not, I suppose, not really real? Can we start to construct a narrative for ourselves that is more beneficial to how we feel? Like, say, so you have, like, low self-worth. Can you start to tell yourself that story that um, is different than that? And then it becomes, eventually becomes the memory and becomes the belief that you have. Yeah, and I think there are um, some therapies that do work um, from this premise that, you're remembering, you know, a certain version of an experience that you encoded, but it may not necessarily be an accurate representation of what actually happened. So if you bring people together who've all experienced the same event, they will retell that narrative in very different ways because it all comes from, you know, your own perspective um, your own feelings at that time as well. And it's very interesting how that sort of spotlight of attention that you have on yourself can color and shade sort of the whole emotional tone and the way in which you embed that event into your own personal sort of self story. And there is opportunity, I think, then to kind of work with those memories and try and go back into them. I mean, a lot of therapies are based on this, picking apart memories from the past and trying to understand them with a new lens and trying to understand perhaps your role or, you know, things that happened that were beyond your control and reframing them and then laying down this new version, you know, with hindsight. And particularly in some um, conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder, there's now a lot of interest in actually being able to modify or perhaps even diminish the emotional reaction that people have when they are triggered into remembering, you know, that traumatic event and trying to use, you know, pharmacological sort of interventions to really dampen and diminish that emotional response or the trauma response so that the memory can just be remembered almost as a factual account without triggering those very um, harmful and distressing feelings alongside it. So that's an interesting angle that's coming out of that post-traumatic stress and um, disorder literature. Psst. I'm just going to do a little circuit breaker here and say thank you for listening to us. If you love the show, let us know. Hit the subscribe button on your podcast app and show us those five-star ratings. Remember to tell your friends about us and check our Patreon page for access to even more content, like extended interviews at patreon.com forward slash reframe of mind. The more people we get talking about mental health, the more supported we'll all be. Leanne helps us to understand the workings of the brain networks to further unlock our knowledge of brain plasticity. You mentioned earlier about how the brain has you know, different sections and different networks, and it's almost like being in a network meeting. If somebody's fallen over somewhere, they all rush to help it. But what's happening at the physical level there? Is it a chemical um, thing that's happening, or are the synapses sort of getting in and sort of looking for different places to, to connect? Or how does that 
How does that work? There's different layers of change that can occur and I suppose this is um, you know one of the big questions that's still being explored at the first level when we're learning a skill and making some change and making sense say of the altered information an expectation would be that there's some reorganization of the brain networks that some of those areas are able to basically chip in and help to make sense of it because we know when we feel anything um, it can be enhanced with the signal because of multiple senses coming into it as well so there's a redundancy in the system there's parallel processing etc I don't want to get into too much of the technical but um, (laughs) I suppose that the first thing is you know if we we look even the functional reorganization we do have this capacity to learn and adapt even if you think in your own situation if you were thinking about you know your swing of a tennis racket you know you can learn adapt or your golf swing with feedback you can learn adapt so there's one level there there's also some evidence of more the change in the synapses that you mentioned to sort of a, a growth of the synapses and the connection um, that's more evident um, in some animal studies and probably takes longer as well but the extent to which that's able to be really captured in real time in uh, in stroke survivors is um, is is relatively limited, but there is some capacity both for the neurogenesis that they talk about and the connection of new synapses, as well as this higher level change, which is a, a reorganization and a and a re um, connecting of the network given that we know that there's a redundancy in the network and there's parallel ways of processing information. Sounds like we're complex machines with a pretty smart operating system Mm. and much easier to update than um, Monterey, I believe, (laughs) because I'm still trying to clear my hard drive to fit that on. Thankfully, you've got enough memory in your brain. (laughs) Uh, So it only makes sense that we might need to sometimes trick the brain into taking the action that we want it to take. Lisa talked to us about how we can use our senses for what's called a pattern interrupt in our cognitive function. Is there a way, for example, of using different senses to disrupt the, I guess, the runaway train that that self-talk can have? So is what you're describing like a pattern interrupt with that kind of thing? Yeah, um, well, I guess, you know, for some people, they're quite visual people, not everyone, but some people are quite visual and they'll think in mental pictures quite a bit. So being able to identify, well, what is the negative image that's popping up for me regarding this thing that I'm bothered by? And what would be a more helpful image? How could we change the image? How could we rewrite the image to be something that's more realistic, it's more reasonable or it's more helpful? Um, You know, how can we change that image for the better? And, And interestingly, you know, and that's really a perspective shift. It's moving from an unhelpful kind of image to a more helpful image, just like we'd move from an unhelpful verbal thought to a more helpful verbal thought. What I find interesting is also working with metaphorical imagery. So the images that we might, the more helpful imagery might come up with doesn't necessarily always have to be like some realistic literal image. So there's actually a lot of value in using metaphors, for example, to kind of disrupt and interrupt that process. So I'll give you my favourite example is I was working with someone who had a very strong fear of negative judgment from other people and sort of the new perspective we were trying to sort of entertain was the idea that you know on the whole people are generally quite nice um, or they're kind of wrapped up in their own worlds and they're not really giving you know them much you know much of a second thought and when we're trying to work on trying to develop this new perspective um, just sort of naturally like an image emerged to capture that more helpful idea and the image that came up was the idea of seeing people as dogs and cats. So, because for this person, like the meaning for them was, well, dogs love you unconditionally. And from their perspective, they said, well, cats couldn't care less about you. They just go off and do their own thing. Now, no offense to cat people out there. I don't want to cause any um, (laughs) controversy about that. that. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, so this kind of seeing people as sort of dogs and cats and in wearing people's clothing and things like that it really conveyed this this message this essential new perspective that yeah people are either nice or you know they're really not paying you much attention but it did it in quite an emotionally evocative sort of a way you know when we would bring this sort of image to mind there was a lot of lightness to it there was a lot of humor we'd we'd laugh a lot about this image um 
so in that way, it was really actually a very powerful sort of way of kind of diffusing the idea that people are threatening and really capturing this more helpful perspective in just such an um, emotionally strong way. So that was a very helpful way of kind of interrupting that negative train of thought that, that can occur. But I also think, so just picking up, because that's, I guess I'm talking about very visual imagery mm. there, but even things like I think, you, you know, around just even how we hold our body, you know, a more physical being, you know, when I'm, you know, exercise I often do with, with people is around, you know, thinking about a situation they find really challenging typically, you know, it's a, it's a triggering kind of situation for them and getting them to imagine, you know, how would you like to be in that situation? How would you like to handle that situation or deal with that situation? And then I get them to imagine actually doing that, being that way, behaving that way, operating that way. And when they're doing that, I'll often ask them things like, you watch your facial expression when you're, you, when you're doing this and can you adopt that expression now as we're doing this imagery exercise or what's your body posture like when you're behaving in this way that you'd like to be and can you adopt that? Because you know, there's kind of, I think that's a big part of things is you know how we are in our bodies can really reflect the same messages. So there's kind of what we're telling ourselves like maybe for example, it's I, I can do this and I am capable. But if someone's body language isn't also reflecting that as well you kind of don't really feel it in your gut so I think trying to get things like what we tell ourselves and kind of our body language all aligned is actually quite helpful as well as kind of interrupting this process and helping people to kind of when they're having trouble switching gear of how they would really like to be and operate in their life in different situations um, I think those all those things actually kind of matter and help is there a tool that would help us to work out which one of these sensors is our dominant one that would be best for us to work with? Um, I, I, there may be, but I haven't come across it. I don't know that there's a specific tool. I think it is about um, a little bit of experimentation. Everyone's different, you know, a bit of trial and error. Um, certainly when I work with people with imagery, you know, I'm not just asking about the visual picture. I'm asking, you know, what can you hear? You know, what can you you know, smell and taste and, and mm. sense in your body. So you could kind of explore all the senses that, you know, make up the image. Because often when people think of, you know, imagery, they just think it's a visual thing, but it's not. It's, it's multi-sensory. Um, you know, when you hear a song playing in your mind and that song's not actually playing, that's an auditory image, you know. So we, we do think, you know, um, with our senses in lots of different ways. So I think it is a process of a little bit of experimenting and seeing kind of what senses really kind of make an impact for that individual so I, I don't know that I can sort of preempt you know what's going to work for each individual other than kind of trying a few things on for size really. So how does rebuilding brain networks happen for people recovering from stroke? Luckily we had Leanne with her expertise on hand to tell us and help us understand how that works. I think if we think about how the brain works it works in networks and in an interconnected way so if part of that network has been damaged by the stroke, then there's the other parts of the network that need to reconnect to make up for that loss. And that's, I suppose, where that readiness and the presence of neuroplastic change is intensified after a stroke because we know that that plasticity is linked with experience and learning. So then, whilst there has been da damage somewhere, if you can see that you can put to the person that the brain has this capacity for change, that it's ongoing the whole time, and really what we need to come together about is how we can shape the change in a way that meets the goals and the new challenges that that person is being presented with. So it really is being very concrete that there is hope because of this phenomenon of neuroplasticity of the brain and because the fact that the brain isn't our ability to do things is not just linked with one area of the brain, it's linked with networks and there's redundancies and capacities to reconnect and reorganise those networks to achieve a better outcome. It might not be exactly the same as it was before, but to achieve the goal that the person's aiming for. Mirren introduced us to some research on meditating monks, which supports this theory as well. 
the other thing that always gets brought up is is that idea of meditation um, in that mindfulness. But that's always something that I've actually struggled with. Now, listening to you talk about imagination and how the second that you kind of relax, your brain just takes off on its own. Maybe we're trying to force ourselves into, I won't have a thought, but that's causing that explosion of thoughts and we should pay attention to that. Yeah, I think as well, the meditation um, literature is very interesting because there have been some really, really um just cool studies looking at, you know, practiced meditators or monks like Tibetan monks who are just highly skilled meditators. And they do show that the way in which their networks, their brain network dynamics, it changes. So the way that the networks are sort of connecting, configuring, it is very different to a non-meditator or non-practiced meditator. And I think there are different versions probably of meditation that we don't probably think of in that way. So for example, I like to do yoga and I find that's the only way that I can get my mind to sort of quell the ongoing chatter. So it's, you're moving, but it's purposeful. You just think about the move, the next move ahead. And some people find Tai Chi is very much like that. It's slow. It's sort of purposeful. And you're just thinking about one move in a motor way. So I think it's more about knowing when you need to reduce the chatter and knowing when it's actually productive for you to let your mind go and knowing when it's it's a good time to put the device down and actually just be with your thoughts and see what comes up because often we're just using our devices as a distraction, I think. So as another example of um, getting out of that state of anxiety or whatever negative thing I put onto it at the time, I, I will go and sit at my piano. I, I can't play piano very well. I'm learning piano, but the act of learning piano I feel sort of using both sides of the brain while I'm doing it is somewhat meditative for me. Is that a similar kind of thing going on in the brain there or is that a completely different? Yeah, I think that's interesting as well. I mean, it's sort of linking in with these other activities like, you know, Tai Chi, yoga, but it's got a motor component. So I think that's quite interesting that we're, it's almost like we need to engage the physicality of our bodies to sort of override that ongoing sort of humdrum or chatter that's maladaptive in the brain if we're if it's causing us distress and I think with music it is it's really interesting because a lot of the processes associated with you know music beat and perception do tend to activate the right side of the brain much more so than the left hand side now you would be using the left hand side in terms of your knowledge and you know verbal and trying to um understand and conceptualize and comprehend what you're doing and then you have this motor component as well if you're using both side both hands you've, you're going to be engaging the motor cortex or motor cortices of both sides of the brain so it's a highly involved very focused and yes i could see how it could be felt as being meditative because you're very actively involved in it so it kind of takes you away from those ruminating or anxiety driven thoughts and brings you back into a, a very task oriented space have there been studies done around that kind of uh, motor skill meditation um, where it's not really meditation, but even when you drive and you kind of go into that autopilot mode, is there anything kind of backing that up that that's equally as good for us as sitting down and trying to om? Um, so I think there's, there is a, a very large literature looking at this sort of toggle between that core network that I mentioned, which enables us to mind wander and enables us to mem- to remember and to imagine. Um, and how that actually is in opposition with an attentional network in the brain, which, you know, one is always active while the other is deactivated and they switch. So this can account for that phenomenon where you're driving and suddenly you're at a new set of traffic lights and you think, I don't even know how I got here. And it may have been just that you, a car horn or something brought you back into the present moment. So it had this sort of salient alerting Um, effect that brings your attentional network, kicks it back in and then suppresses or inhibits the activation in that core default mode network. Um, There's a lot of studies that are looking at how information flows across these two systems, how one system activates, the other one is sort of suppressed and vice versa. Um, I'm not as sure whether they've looked at this in terms of like motor skills and meditation and whether they've brought all of this together. I'm sure there's people working on these topics, though, because it's a very um, current line of investigation within the literature at the moment. 
Now, as strange as it might sound, we started to understand there might, in fact, be some value in trauma, which Kimberly helped us to unpack. Trauma can be a catalyst for lots of different outcomes, both psychologically as well as neurologically, so actually in terms of the brain structure and function. And what we do know is that essentially that pathway following trauma, so whether somebody is able, as you say, to to strengthen, resolve, to be resilient versus experiencing longer term distress as a result of the traumatic experience actually relates to a combination of factors. One being the way their brain was working at the time. So if they had a, a neurochemical imbalance for any reason, then they're much more likely to experience distress. If they've had a ex- history of social or emotional disadvantage, they're much more likely to experience distress. However, people who are in a fairly stable environment or are able to use their, their experience as a way to, again, strengthen their resolve or to pursue new opportunities, then we do see incredibly resilient outcomes and even growth outcomes. And we call that post-traumatic growth. And although we've known about the fact that some people inexplicably sometimes seem to thrive following trauma, we really have only been closely studying that group of people for maybe 20 to 30 years. So we still know a lot more about people who suffer distress than people who experience positive outcomes. Yeah, it really seems like a, a foreign concept, an alien concept to think that there could be a post-traumatic growth because we do hear so much about post-traumatic stress, which obviously is very important for us to, to acknowledge and deal with. Most but definitely. Could there be some value in looking at some of the ways people do grow out of trauma? I, I have to uh, declare my bias right here because I'm absolutely <laughs> one of those researchers. Um, ah, there you so go. <laughs> that's it. So my, my biases are very much that, and as you say, it is vitally important we understand how to support people who do experience distress. And it's very important for us to understand the factors that lead to that distress because it helps us then focus on effective and evidence-based treatment. But my question has always been, what can we learn from people who thrive that can both help them to continue to thrive, protect people in the future, but also possibly and hopefully help people who have experienced distress? And basically, we call that a salutogenic paradigm, where you recognise that there can be both positive and negative at the same time. And for a comprehensive understanding, you need to acknowledge both. Can we pre-plan for trauma? To a degree, to a degree. So when we're talking about pre-planning for trauma, it is about cultivating cognitive flexibility. That's a really big part of it. Mm. It's also about cultivating social support networks. So having networks of support from people who are safe, who we can trust, and who we have that sense of connection and belonging. Because that ties back to that idea of purpose and meaning. And what we do find is that people who have those strong relationship ties before a trauma, the reason they can mobilise, and although this word might seem strange, but capitalise during a trauma is because they have that sense of purpose in meaning, that my purpose here is to support the people who are important to me. And in doing so, that shared experience, so collective undertaking and collective success survival then in turn gives more purpose and meaning to that sense of belonging and we call that an upward spiral of positive emotion. It sounds like what it goes on when you know so a, a, a rape survivor or, or something like that that has been in a horrific situation then goes on to publicly speak about it and create change and awareness re um, reactivating or re, re-talking about their trauma but doing it in a way now that actually makes change. And there's some important things there, as you said, that these individuals are incredibly courageous Mm. and incredibly brave to be willing to be vulnerable in that way, to speak about their experience. But in doing so, there are so many powerful outcomes for themselves, as well as for people who have experienced similar traumas. So number one is this sense of validation. In other words, it is not okay, it did happen and it needs to change rather than that's not something we talk about. It's also about 
as you say, mobilising change and mobilising people because that's a sense of purpose. You know, whether it be rape, whether it be another form of trauma, most in and of themselves are horrific and they are senseless. However, when a survivor takes control of their narrative, and what I mean by that is that they are able to publicly speak about this, whether it be within their own social circles, whether it be at a higher platform, whether it be through media, whether it be through police, whatever avenue that fits for them, they are actually taking control of the situation. And through taking control, we know that that increases the likelihood of resilient outcomes, but it also gives them a sense of meaning to their experience. The event itself remains senseless and completely unnecessary. But what they do with their survival gives them a sense of purpose and meaning and in doing so empowers themselves and others. Mirren also spoke about the benefit of trauma in creating positive change. I think, again, this really does come down to the nature of the trauma, um, the individual personality and resilience of the person and the support that they have around them. So I think I would be very reluctant to say that, you know, trauma is beneficial because ideally Mm. we shouldn't be living in a world where people are exposed to some of the horrors that we hear about in the news. Um, We do see people rising up and becoming amazing advocates against, you know, these horrific experiences. But I think for every case that we hear about, that's, you know, the exemplar and the amazing person who can rise above it. There are countless nameless others who have really terrible lives on the back of traumatic experiences and who actually can't regroup. So I personally would feel that, you know, it would be better to stamp out the cause of the trauma rather than, you know, using it to say that, you know, you can achieve great things on the back of it. Yeah, I guess in the absence of being able to stamp out trauma, I'm not saying that we should be going in and traumatising people for um, for progress. Um, But is there something we can learn from the people who have come out differently from those traumatic events that we could give to those who perhaps haven't found a way to do that? Possibly, but I guess as well, it, it really does speak to, you know, the differences that make us, that, you know, just makes this tapestry of life so different. And I think it would... It could come at a cost if we're saying, well, look, these people have been able to do X, Y and Z to overcome what they faced. You should be able to do that, too. So I think we would have to be very careful about not being prescriptive um, and trying to show people who've come through traumatic situations that there's a way out. Because, I mean, nobody wants to be suffering from PTSD and it's an extremely debilitating and distressing condition. Um, Likewise, a lot of people don't want to be addicted to substances and don't want to have, you know, gambling addictions. And I think it's very difficult to hold up people who have made it through um, as a shining example that could actually be demoralizing or demotivating as well. For addictive substances, it's a very, um, very potent biological effect and it can end up being um, almost like that conditioned response that we're talking about. So it's goes beyond um it becomes almost automatic that you're you know you have this hit you have an instant response to it and immediately once that has worn off then you're primed and craving for the next hit so there are some substances that are just so highly addictive it's almost an instant cycle of you know of abuse and then looking for the next hit those particular behaviors are very difficult to control or to to um, ameliorate because it's a very primary sort of basic reward pathway that's being operated on. And that's when we see people acting in ways that they wouldn't ever have dreamed of prior, you know, to trying these substances. So here's the thing. Mm. The conversations in Reframe of Mind explore some of the common ground we all face when it comes to mental health and our brain's function. So with our ladies of STEM in front of us, we were keen to explore what's in their mental health toolkit. Leanne Carey shares her techniques based on her own learning. Just going back to the idea that because this is so strongly founded on robust principles of neuroplasticity and learning, and many of these principles actually came originally from looking at normal motor learning, normal perceptual learning, and then cross-calibrating that which we need to do with the brain following injury. 
And I suppose if we um, think about it, even with some of the questions that you've asked, which I think are really important, perhaps even at that first level, really making sure we have a select tasks that are meaningful and graded and varied, that'll help you transfer. And when you're engaged in the task, make sure that you've got a very clear goal in the task and it could be a sub goal or it could be a task goal along the way because that will make sure that you then um, direct your attention in a meaningful way because there's this self-organizing capacity as well within the brain so it's really about if you get to the goal and let the brain do what it needs to do a little bit behind, that's important. And then you want to, if we think about how the brain works, you know, in networks and things, think about how we can use feedback and maybe even that calibration to match the experience. Um, I think the anticipation is another um, key goal that we could use, um, you know, know what to expect to feel, tune into it, so ready yourself for uh, what it is that's um, your goal for learning. And then the other thing is, you know, the repeat and progress, so to um, bring that into the task. And I, I suppose really one of the one that for us, if things are working well, that really might be um, the as important or more important is that strategy learning, like to really go in with it um, to discover what the task is presenting to you and how you can work with that task and manipulate it to achieve the goal, the outcome that works for you. So that sort of um, that metacognition sort of strategy learning as well. We've learned a lot about the brain in these conversations and we were curious to ask Mirren whether we've got a thorough enough understanding at this point or whether we're just scratching the surface. I think this is one of the great things about the, the discipline that I'm working in. It's like you chip away but every every time you do a study that you think you've kind of, you know, isolated a little piece of the puzzle, inevitably it raises more questions. <laughs> and so you think, oh, now I need to, we well, didn't think about that. Or, you know, you get comments back from reviewers on your papers and they'll say, oh, it's very interesting. Have you thought about this? And, you know, I'm working on topics now that maybe five years ago I hadn't even considered and I think that's one of the things I love. It's like, I don't, you know, you wouldn't want to just solve everything because then that's the end of the journey. So mm -hmm. it's it's like a constant sort of a, like a voyage where you're just learning, discovering there's new advances, new techniques, new collaborations. And I think that's why it's just so great to be a scientist because you're just constantly learning and discovering. And Leanne helped us to answer an age old question very common thing we hear throughout society is that you can't teach an old dog new tricks but it seems that any dog if willing myself included i think this dog has kind of learned that i can learn anything right up until the time i leave the earth absolutely so the teach an old dog new tricks is not right <laughs> um <laughs> So you can teach an old dog new tricks. I mean, the saying's not right. You can teach an old dog new tricks. But even better than teaching the old dog new tricks is to teach the dog how to discover new ways of doing things. Love it. And, mm -hmm. and to me, this is when I hear feedback from stroke survivors that to me is most reinforcing of this therapy. They actually learn the how to do it and so then when I hear that they're using it in everyday activities and I catch up with them years later they say I'm still using that compare with this I do that and such and such they had a problem I told them how to do it huh. um, and and then it's yeah so it's being open and believing in that discovery of learning it but also having ways that um you can bring it together with principles such as this, which are very robust in neuroscience, to actually start on that pathway and continue on it to change. And, 
you know, it comes back to what we started with. I mean, if you think about reframe the mind, it's about adapting and learning. Neuroplasticity of the brain is the mechanism or the phenomenon that supports that adaptation and learning. And if we engage in the tasks and we believe in this and we've got a little bit of that know-how how how to do it, then we can achieve that change with both the discovery and the knowledge. One of the things I wrote down uh, today that is going to be my big takeaway um, is change your behavior, change the brain. And I would have actually always put it as the other way around. So that's an eye-opener. It is an eye-opener and I think it does challenge us to recognize the reciprocal nature but also to realize that the control is back with us Mm. in terms of what we can do, not only what we can do to challenge and make that change, but also how we experience what we do uh, in terms of making that change. So the locus is back with us. Next time on Reframe of Mind, we'll revisit what motivates us, given this new knowledge on brain plasticity. With a little bit of help from Science Here Professor Joe Forgus AM. Typically, people make those sorts of decisions once they have more information. You won't leave your job until you have a better one. You don't leave your spouse until you have a better one. I mean, people typically hedge their bets and try to get more information. You, you very rarely jump into the, the unknown if you can help it. You've been hearing our story. Now we really want to hear yours. Connect with at Reframe of Mind on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and Twitter. Or connect with at Welcome Change Media on LinkedIn. You can also contact us via reframeofmind.com.au with your stories or suggestions for future topics. We'd like to thank today's guests for sharing their personal stories and insights. And for more information on any of the subjects, guests or references used in this episode, please see our show notes or reframeofmind.com.au. Reframe of Mind is a Welcome Change Media production.